Okay, so welcome everyone to our little webinar here. Today we have our guest, uh, our adjunct professor, Sabrina Fernandez. She's here to talk to you about localized storytelling. So before we hand it over to her, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, Sabrina herself. So, oops, sorry, let me share my audio. We have a little video to play here as well. Okay, so um, Sabrina herself here is actually the co-founder of Wild Snapper TV. Uh, they have worked on projects such as the Apprentice Asia and uh, Fear Factor amongst many, many other things. Uh, again, working in productions for things like Disney Channel, ABC, Discovery, Asian Food Network, uh, TLC. She's also one of the very, very, very few Malaysians who have actually won an international Emmy Award, I think back in 2012, for her work as a producer on The Amazing Race Australia. And in 2018, she co-produced, uh, wrote and directed her first um, feature film. It was a co-production between Malaysia and Iran. I can't pronounce the name of this <laughs> film, but uh, yeah, okay. Um, what is it? And in uh, what is it called in English? In in, in an endless in an endless, in an endless uh, boundless instant. Is that what it's <laughs> called? Okay, so I'm just going to play you the trailer for a, the film, which was produced for Astro, right? Yeah, and Iran. Yeah. Astro and Iran. So here she with her Emmy Award. And this is the trailer of the film itself. Are you a couple married? Married. It's nice. First travel? Yes. yes. So it's a honeymoon. Let's go to the best honeymoon. Oh, wow. Well, welcome to Iran. Is everything okay? I married you because you're different. As soon as we get back to your country, you just change. Even though we're married, I still feel like we're still getting to know each other. Okay, so that was that. Uh, just a quick couple of house rules. So we save all the questions for the end of the session. She is going to be speaking for about 40 minutes or so. And after which um, I will open it up for Q&A. So if you have questions, uh, just click on the raise hand icon on the top of your screens. Uh, I will call you. And when I call you, then you turn on your microphones and ask away your questions. Um, without further ado, we're just going to pass it on to uh, Ms. Zabrina. Zabrina, take it away. Hi, everyone. This is um, still very unusual for me to, to talk to a screen. Um, so I hope uh, that, you know, today you, you guys can get something from this. I'm actually in the middle of shoot, so excuse the location. Um, and uh, maybe there might be some noise and interruption, but you know, this is the industry you're going to be in. So I, I think this is, uh, you know, a little bit of real life happening. Um, I'm going to share with you, just bear with me, don't do this often. So, um, is it sharing? No, sharing nothing. Sharing. It is? So we see your desktop. Yep. Do you see this? Yeah, local stories. Okay. Great. Okay. So basically, this is something close to my heart. As you, as you could see um, from the very first film that I did, it's, it's uh, a story that is something that I knew about. So I hope there's something that you guys can sort of get from this. I just really want to talk about local stories, but having a more international appeal. I think I'll skip this bit since uh, you guys already know a little bit about me me. I've been in the industry for now over 20 years and I worked in Australia, I've worked with the uh, US companies and 
yeah, and then now I'm moved on into more film stuff. So we get a lot of interns um, working with us uh, in Wildsnapper, and I love to ask this question. So I ask, what is your favorite local movie? And I don't know if you guys can guess what the most frequent answer to this question is. Any guesses? Anybody turn on your mic and tell me what you think your, your answer to this is? Most of the time, actually all the time, this is the answer that I get. I don't watch local films. Most of the time, this is what you guys um, answer. And I, I, I get it, you know, the big budget Hollywood films, they're, they, they are far more attractive. But I think since most of you, this is going to be the industry where you will at least start your career, be, um, I think it would make sense for you to get to know it a little bit better. So I'll just introduce to you some of my local favorites. So these are four movies that I really like. They're all a little bit different. Um, if you're not familiar with it, One Two Jaga was um, done about uh, corruption as well as illegal illegal immigrants, um, and it went international. Interchange is a movie that's folkloric. It's based on uh, the director Dan Syed said it was based on the idea that um, Borneo women think that if their photograph is taken, part of their soul is captured. So, you know, they sort of wash themselves in the river in order to, to rid of that. Sepet is uh, by the legendary director Yasmin Ahmad. Again, very local film, um, uh, but, you know, an international story, like story uh, or, or love theme about forbidden love. And the Lucky Harapan Dunya is a comedy. Um, it is hilarious in a sense that only um, locals get it in a way, but very, very international um, uh, subject matter where the dad is trying to do something for his daughter. So I wanted to share with you, in case you haven't already seen this, this is um, Interchange. <laughs> Sorry, what happened there? Sorry, guys, no idea what happened there. Where is my apologies, everybody? Please. Oh, sorry. Color it is ever. Was it no? I owe people money. They want me to retrieve something from you. The negative is just like that. Look, I don't want you to get involved.
Okay, so that was uh, Interchange. And these are a couple more movies. I don't know if any of you have seen them, so we can discuss this later. There's Jagat, um, which is a story about a coming of age of a young boy, a young Indian boy in Malaysia that has a father that's, you know, poor, but trying to do good things, but, you know, not very loving. And then the lure of his uncle who is in a gang and has has money. So, you know, it is that, that very precarious age about what do you do? Do you follow the good, but then, you know, suffer or do you go with this? It's a, it's a really, really interesting story. Ola Bola is an inspirational sports film. The Journey is a film about, uh, it was um, dual language. So it was about a girl who is getting married to, uh, to an Angmo and decides to bring him back to her Chinese dad and the cultural differences that they face. Europa, Here I Am is a film that was shot in uh, Greece about refugees and it's about a man, a Malaysian man trying to help someone there, but then he basically has troubles at home. So there's another trailer, but I think I'll skip that. You guys can watch Jagat on your own. Okay, so why do I like these films? Okay, one thing about these films is they're all very, very Malaysian stories, um, but they have a universal theme that can be understood and relatable worldwide. So I like that about um, those films that I picked. And just like any stories, they move the audience and they make you feel something. And I think that's important about a story that you want to tell. It's got to move you and it's got to make the audience feel something. So some of these films have also won awards and some have managed to be um, screened internationally. So Jagat, for example, it's uh, best film in Mala during, at the Malaysian Film Festival in 2016. It is the first non-Bahasa film to win, to win. It's also the first Tamil language local movie to screen in cinemas for eight weeks straight. That's quite a feat um, for any local films, or let alone a Tamil movie that was that you know is predominantly um, uh, where your your audience is predominantly mass Malay. The Journey was in the International ASEAN Film Festival and Awards. It really was one of those films that made the rest of ASEAN look at Malaysia. It had um, a very, very heartwarming theme and it just transcended across, um, not just our country, but across across the, the nations. Interchange, it was nominated for the Variety Piazza Grande Award at Locarno. Um, I'm not sure if any of you know about Locarno International Film Festival, but it's a big festival. And Interchange got um, viewed, it was opened at the Piazza, which is the biggest um, kind of um, arena for viewing. And it was also a part of the Osaka Film Festival. It was a collaboration between Malaysia and, um, and Indonesia, as you could see some Indonesian actors. So I wanted to go into a bit genre versus theme for this. I, I'm sure you guys go through this in your university and you know it. But just in terms of genre, there's, you know, action, adventure, comedy, drama, fantasy, romance, Western thriller, musical, mystery, detective, or, you know, like police procedure, like law, films, or historical fiction. And historical um, uh, could really be, be matched with any of the genres. So it's historical romance, historical adventure, like Indiana Jones, historical romance, like Titanic. Um, so that's when you cover genre. Then when we talk about theme, a theme is the film's central unifying concept. Um, so for example, like I said, love is like one of the recent movies called Love, Rosie or Titanic. Sacrifice is a movie with Charlize Theron called Tully. It's about a mother who just um, um, had a newborn and sort of coping with postnatal depression. Good versus evil, all the Marvel star series, all the Star Wars series, that's your typical good versus evil theme. Justice, um, I just watched a really wonderful film called Just Mercy. Um, starring Jamie Foxx, um, that's straight up a justice sort of film, and Perseverance, something like Pursuit of Happiness and The Greatest Showman, where the protagonist is, um, um, you know, they're faced with something, a challenge right up in the front, and then they basically have to keep keep going to get to, to what they're after. Okay, I think everybody knows this as well, the save seven basic plot um, plots according to Christopher Booker. And just to go through them very quickly, so as we talk about stuff, you can keep this in mind. So um, the first one is overcoming the monsters, so stuff like Silence of the Lambs. 
I put Little Red Riding Hood there because it's it's the easiest. Everybody knows this story, and and therefore you know that it, you know it's the easiest example. Interchange is also overcoming the monster, and Joker in, in inner monster. Rags to riches stories like Cinderella, Jane Eyre, and Pretty Woman. Probably telling my age a bit by saying Pretty Woman. Um, the Quest is a the third basic plot, which is you know, stuff like Lord of the Rings and Ola Bola. Voyage and Return, The Hobbit, Lion King, Back to Future, Europa, Here I Am, is a voyage where the protagonist goes away and returns with something, a lesson or a growth in the character. Rebirth, something like Pride and Prejudice, uh, the easiest one is Beauty and the Beast. Um, comedy, I put Twelfth Night Fair just to kind of pay homage to some old school um, Shakespeare stuff. So, you know, comedy can be have a variety of dark comedy and then pure slapstick. Um, even something like The Journey is categorized as comedy um, uh, because it has the underlying tones of uh, cultural differences and, and, and the, the troubles that it brings. Tragedy, straight up, Romeo and Juliet, um, Picture of Dorian Gray, something like Jagat as well. So I know you guys know this film and I'm sure you've talked about it in your classes. I wanted to bring Parasite up as an example because it is a Korean film. It is not a film um, done by Americans or done by anybody else. It was a Korean film in Korea with Korean actors, very uniquely Korean settings, I mean, with the toilet and everything. And they tackled universal issues, social injustice, class inequalities, and capital, uh, capitalistic greed, basically. So no one, I believe, could have written this story this way except for a Korean. He didn't write about an American guy. He wrote about basically what's happening in Korea. And I think it's a really good example of, of you know, transcending uh, uh, barriers and transcending uh, even language barriers to something that a film that is, is good and uniquely um, from a certain country. So also in... China, we, we know that there's a lot of directors that have come off China and um, Wong Kar Wai is probably my favorite. Um, I believe the movie Moonlight is very, very much um, an expression of his uh, cinematography style. So if you don't know any of these directors, I recommend you look them up. Um, they are essentially good at their craft of doing what they know from where they're from. Um, and then because of their skill, it transcended into bigger things in Hollywood. Um, so Ang Lee, of course, um, you know, we, we know him from the start from Crouching Tiger and Hidden Dragon. And then it went on to Life of Pi and John Wu, who's done some incredible things as well. Okay, so write about what you know is basically my point. Tell the stories of the things that surround you. There's a lot of inspiration that you can get from things around you. And I think that writing something closer to heart is always something easier and better first. They come from everywhere. So one way or one trick to do it is basically to keep your eyes and ears open in supermarkets, restaurants, everywhere you go, or hear the folk stories your grandma tells you. If something piques your interest, ask yourself what makes it uniquely Malaysian yet international and keep this question sort of in your mind at all times. Good stories, I believe, get attention. So write about your what you're passionate about and find inspiration first from your surroundings. And then, but when you're writing, also keep your audience in mind. I mean, write, when you write, you do write what you're interested in, but you also need to cater for who you're writing for. Who is this going to reach? Does this make sense kind of in a local context if that's where you're aiming for? Or if you're going, no, I'm kind of going for international, so I want a bit of creative liberty to cheat a little bit on, on, on certain nuances, uh, local nuances, then, then yes. But I think always keep your audience in mind. So I always say, you know, if you're writing about a detective story, but, you know, you're shooting it here and they're all based here, but your nuances are foreign. He eats a donut, for example. Where's a trench coat? You'll probably start polarizing your audience and your audience will start picking on these little things rather than the universal feel of the film. Um, I know you can't see that bottom, but I'm scared if I press that hide, it will go the whole thing will go. Anyway, so I'll just say, be, so be bold in the story you're pursuing. Asians, we have lots of beliefs, folklore, history, language, ways of thinking, living, and these are all quite uniquely us. 
these are all good base for stories and they're great for collaboration as well. Start for something with maybe a different country or um, uh, kind of a different, um, even a different culture within Malaysia. So between Malays and uh, Chinese or something. So always, always try to see what you can tap in from what you know first. I wanted to also bring in some stories from Indonesia. These are original stories from um, Indonesia. I can't see what's written here. But Viro Sembleng basically was a collaboration. Um, um, Lifelike Pictures sort of got a collaboration with Century Fox, and um, they were in, they got investment for for that for Viro Sembleng. Grise was is about a, you know the uprising uh, during the Dutch colonialism in Indonesia. And it is one of HBO's originals. HBO doesn't do much original so far. They've done, um, what was the one that they did? But I can't remember the name now, but this was just, uh, this sort of just came out late 2019, early last year. And and they picked Indonesia. Diost was um, Shantiamania Har Harmin's wartime thriller. It's a co-production between Dutch a Dutch company and a US company as well as Indonesia because it is based in Indonesia. Again, a story that's quite um, Indonesian in its uh, location, but also, you know, there are um, cross-cultural um, uh, experiences from, you know, the soldier for this and as well the people in Indonesia for this story. So these are very local stories that have made it to Amazon and, and uh, HBO and also the big screen. Part of the films that you know make it sometimes may not be the films that you like to make. It may not be the films that you're interested in making. But some local films they which get high uh, ROI. ROIs are return on investment, meaning that you spend ten dollars but you get a hundred dollars for it. So in this case, these films were very very low budget films, or not very low, but lower. Um, than what they expected to get in the box office, but they get, got big um, big returns in the box office. So first one I wanted to bring up is Hantu Katlima. Um, if you're in the film industry here and you intend to be in the film industry here, this is something that you kind of need to study. In a sense, where Hantu Katlima was only 1.2 million to make, but they grossed 36.23 uh, million. So this was a film that was directed by Mamat Khalid. In I don't get it. I watch it and I go, mm, okay. But, you know, there, there is an audience there that obviously enjoyed it very much. And Mama Khaled knew exactly what he was doing. So even if you don't like something, I reckon you should always watch um, the good, the bad, um, because it sort of at least forms your idea of, you know, the audience that you're catering for. Okay, so Munafik 2 was 2.5 million, made 48 million. Pascal, 10 million, made 28.98 million. Munafik was a religious... Um, and horror, which is something that does really well in Malaysia. Pascal, patriotic um, uh, film, and this was about the the army, so which was something that was quite cool and exciting to see. And animation always does well. Agent Ali did really, really good, 6.5 million in its budget, and the gross was over 30 million, so it was pretty spectacular. See, I don't know if you guys recognize Ali, that's me and Ali. So here's the truth, just some truths about um, when you're first starting out. So when you're first starting out, you may have to do things you don't like, which is why I wanted to bring up this, those movies with high ROIs or, you know, Kantu Katlima. You're most likely going to be a part of a production company um, helping in a film. That's It's not your script. It's not your idea. You may not like it, um, but there's always something to learn there. So always don't miss the chance to, to see what you are learning from that situation, from, from that particular project that you're doing. <coughs> Excuse me. You're not going to be sitting next to the director, yeah? So I don't um, mean you can't keep your eyes on the set when you're done with whatever duties that you're doing and see how the director works. And, you know, there's always conversation during lunch. And But um, you can also learn to chip in in other departments. I think make friends with everyone and you'll get one step closer. But these are straight up truths. So a lot of people say, oh, I didn't expect to be doing this. I thought I would be learning more about filmmaking. But learning about filmmaking it's partially your duty on the side, and it's also everything, all encompassing. It can't just be you sitting next to the director and learning. That's that's just not how it works. 
And here's some also hard truths. You make peanuts in the beginning. The industry is quite brutal. It's long hours. And most of the times the money is not great to start with. So always know why you're doing this. I think I did one lecture last time before where I said, know your why. Know why you went into this industry and you keep hustling and you, so that you can keep, um, in, you keep that fire burning, keep being hungry. I want to give you an example of a um, movie. I'm not sure if you know um, uh, that Danish girl. That movie took 14 years before it got made. They went through so many hurdles and most films are like that. Jagat took 10 years to make. They went through so many financial difficulties. Um, so, you know, they did other projects, they hustled on other things, but they keep came, coming back to it. So not everything that you see that's made it on, on screen, even um, The Queen's Gambit took seven years to make because nobody believed in the script. So believe in yourself and keep hustling and always know why you're doing it, okay? Here's, here's a truth also about smaller budgets. One thing about smaller budgets is it's tough, but you get experience. The value of experience in this industry is like gold. In the local industry, you pretty much get given a lot to do because of a smaller budget. So you gain a lot of experience very quickly. And that makes you resilient. I think smaller budget means you have to multitask, right? Gives you multi multiple skills. And this really kind of helps you with trying to find a job or trying to get into the industry in many, many different projects. Um, I want to tell you an example um, uh, of myself, really. When I first started out, um, I worked in um, a news, and then after that, I worked in a music channel. It's like MTV. It doesn't really exist anymore. But on this, I pretty much had to do everything. I was script writer. I was researcher. I was studio director. I was on location director, I was camera operator, audio operator, interviewer, editor, and we interviewed all the celebrities and all the big stars. And sometimes I operated the camera and then pressed play and then sat down and, 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 and did the interview. So, I mean, it was really tough. But four years of that, and being a one-man show, when I moved to Australia um, and I was interested in multiple jobs, I realized that I could apply for, for a lot more of that because I was skilled in so many different departments. So when I went to Australia, I, I got a job in casting and then I went to being a writer and then a producer. So don't, um, don't be discouraged by that small budget. I think learn from it and really grow from it because it allows you a lot of creative thinking. I can tell you that until today when faced with budget constraints and stuff, I think um, you also then work on your story. What is the, the strongest point in how can you tell the story effectively without spending a lot of money. You do work harder to tell um, better stories. Okay. At the end of the day, I think if this is the industry that you're going to be in, knowing the local industry is really everybody's responsibility. Trust me, I was naive too. And I used to think, oh, no, I'll just, I don't care about what happens here. But this is where um, we work. This is also our, our opportunity to grow um, lots of things. So, I think we need to grow the audience is basically my first point. You want to give the audience a chance to grow with you, you, the filmmakers that are making the films. You want to keep pushing different types of stories um, that are both local yet appealing to an international market. So, you know, the stories can be things like folklore. Pick something that, um, for example, we're working on a horror film at the moment that is just based on the Batu Bela, Batu Petangkuk uh, uh, story and trying to use that as our base um, of, of forming the entire um, plot lines. Um, historical, also working in a current film that's about, it's a historical sports film, and it's based on four women that, um, you know, made the country really proud in athletics in the 1980s. Social injustices, there's a lot happening in Malaysia. There's a lot that you can um, talk, talk about, write about, even do short films about and these stories. And we know that movies, you know, get the attention um, of people much faster. A lot of people learn about things through movies. So this is your chance, basically, to, to, to see what's happening and, and write those stories. And also, when you're writing it, like when you're starting out, don't sort of um, uh, look down at things you don't understand. I think it's it's an opportunity to look at things, something like Hantu Katlima and see if this something works for you. What was it in that that works? And how can you incorporate that because you want to cater for your audience? Um, so stuff like that, you always think, think about it, keep it in the back of your mind. 
there's a market out there for good stories. So even if something isn't initially what you wanted it to be, go with it if it tells a better story for your audience. And I think every generation is smarter. You are way smarter than we are. You've got way more technology as well. So don't just do things the way that they've always been done. I think when someone says, oh, no, you can't do that. You've got to do this or you've got to tell this story. I think respect the path and understand it, but continue to push the boundaries, even if it's a little bit at a time. And watch local movies. I think you've got to be critical and you've got to build upon that. You can't um, just, you know, say, I don't watch local movies and then be done with it. I think you need to encourage your friends to watch it too. And then if you watch stuff and you go, well, you know, they, they don't do anything about me. I don't feel connected to that. I'm not, you know, that means you're not represented. And then if you aren't, that's where your voice, your film comes in here because you're writing for the next generation. So go and watch local movies and be critical about what you watch. I'm not saying watch it and love it, but say, oh, okay, this could have been done this. Or, okay, maybe they had a budget constraint here. What could I have done better? always use that as a learning opportunity. So how do you learn? I believe locally you can learn from the best. Figure out your style. In Malaysia, it, like I said, in, for most of you, it will be the starting point, right, for your filmmaking journey. So it's important to know what interests you um, that's out there. For example, you know the style of Tarantino or Scorsese, and if you had a chance to pick between the two directors, I think you would pick the one closest to what you're interested in. So in Malaysia, different directors, different production companies, they all do different things. So I think knowing the films you like, the directors you like, the writers you like, it would help you to be one step closer to kind of honing your style. So I just wanted to put some directors out here um, just for you to kind of um, absorb if you don't know them. Dan Syed did Interchange and Bunohan. He, he likes uh, folkloric stuff and he, you know, he always does keep his storyline quite local, but very, very international appeal and cinematography. Nadira Zakaria is a photographer first and who's now transcended her style of photography into filmmaking. And she's um, known for all the Bahasa Sini Netflix series. I really like her and I believe she's really going to show up and coming up, I promise. Uh, Ken Guan is known for Ola Bola, The Journey, um, and you know they're always quite epic. Mama Khaled is that's what he looks like. He is the director of Hanti Pali Mayo. He's also an actor. Amanda Nell Yu, she's quite um, new, and I think her style is very indie. They're still very raw, but it has a a market there. And, and I think if you, we see like the if you anybody's watched Nomadland, um, which uh, you know. It, the, the director is a female director and she's nominated for for an academy first um first asian female director to be nominated it's you know i think all of that kind of raw um storytelling um um is is a style that that i i believe we'll we'll see more of in the future now namawi name we i can never pronounce his way name um he's very controversial but i liked I like that, you know, I like that he pushes boundaries. I like that he makes people question stuff. His uh, latest film is banned in Malaysia, it's called Babi, um, but the trailer was out for a while and it looked fantastic. Um, so if you can watch it, Tan Chui Mui is very seasoned. She's an indie uh, director and Adrian Tay who did um, Pascal and Vera, patriotic films. <coughs> Writers, Adele Lim, if you don't know her, look her up. Crazy Rich Asian, she wrote that, and she wrote Raya. And Raya, she wrote, a, you know, she drew inspiration from, from Malaysia and a lot of Asian countries. So, and I think that's cool that she's made it and she she's written it, a co, it's uh, co-written with a Vietnamese writer. And, um, you know, there's a lot of Asian elements. So once you make it, I think it's great when you bring all these elements um, to a bigger, bigger audience. Mira Mustafa is very well known in the writer's world. She wrote Sanka, Pulang, and many, many other things. Alfie Palmero, he's done J Revolusi, Police Evo, and he's now kind of done a lot, a few horrors. I wanted to also introduce you guys to Rene Pillay. If you guys have not heard of the Nicole Fellowship, look it up. Um, it's basically a writing grant by the Oscars, and she's the very first Asian winner, and she's a Malaysian girl. Um, and, you know, her, her, her writing style is also very cool. So some production companies to take note of, Infinitus, Jazzy Pictures, Wayang Works, Kuman Pictures, 
Uh, Coleman Pictures just uh, produced Roll for a very, very small budget, 400000 And they that film was the Malaysians rep, Malaysia's represented, uh, representation to the Oscars this year. So I think oh, I'm going to leave you with invest in the industry that you're in. If this is going to be where you're going to be making your mark and your money, then invest in it. Um, I think the growth of the industry really depends on the maturity of its audience. And if you're not watching it, and, and you're in it, then it, you know, there's really um, quite, you should watch it. One day you'll be also in the film studios and networks. What you know about the industry will matter and make a difference so that you can make a difference and pick and commission films that, that, that you know, push boundaries a little bit. I think you tell better stories when you've got the right reason for doing it and when you know the story well. Don't go writing about some place somewhere you have no idea about. Um, if you do want to write about stuff like that, I think an intense amount of research goes in. But I think there will be elements with the character that you identify with. So I think be proud of you and our and your stories. And always don't don't see yourself as, you know, like um, lack of inspiration. You are, you have many stories to tell. And lastly, Korea has a population of 51 million, Malaysia 31. We're not that much difference in size yet. Their reach is big and global. I think their focus is on their stories and their audience first. And I believe we can too. Um, yep, that's it, guys. I think good luck and be bold. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sabrina. Okay. I will now open it up for the Q&A. So as mentioned earlier, if you have a question, Okay. Uh, please click the hands up icon and then I will call you up uh, one by one. So some names coming up here. Nabil, do you want to turn on your mic? Hi, yes. Uh, I have a two-part question, so to say. Okay. okay so would you think there's a specific genre of local movies that attracts people more, like action and horror? So Police Evil, Vera and Nafik. Yeah. And what would you say to people to give local movies that don't fall into these popular genres a chance? Um, sorry, am I still sharing my screen? I have no idea. Yes, you uh, are. Yeah, yeah. How you do I stop, stop that? How do I stop that? Oh, Perfect. stop. The, the little X, yeah. Okay, because I'm trying to turn on my camera. Um, I'm sorry, can, can you go again? Okay, so would you think there's a specific genre of local movies that attracts people more? So like uh, action, like Police Evil and Mira, as well as horror, like Munafik? Mm -hmm. And what would you say to people to give local movies that don't fall into these genres uh, a chance? Um, okay. I, okay, so this is basically my life. I, I face this every day. So the, the genres that attract people more, yes, there is. Um, and there's, you know, the, the big uh, studios and uh, big networks, they sort of uh, focus on that. So the genres that attract um, um, animation is starting to get picked up. Um, horror and religion. Um, and then with a spattering of patriotism. So any patriotic films tend to do well, horror does well. Um, love used to do really well, but it seems to be slowing down. So those are the genres that attract um, more of the audience. And I think networks do take a chance um, with uh, um, the, the, the genres of films that don't fall in that category. The good thing now is, you know, there's more OTT platforms. So they do try to, to, to invest in a little bit, you know, diversify a little bit. But they may try uh, by giving you a smaller budget. So then it's really your duty to work on, you've got to be quite resourceful. Once you become a, a filmmaker, I think you realize very quickly that you've also got to be an entrepreneur in a sense where how can you get extra budget in order to make that film you want to make? Because a lot of, here's a tip, a lot of people would want to give you some money if you say, hey, I've also got, if you give me 200,000 or 300,000, I can find 200,000 from X, Y, Z. Whether you, crowd, like some people have made films by crowdsourcing, um, sorry, crowdfunding. So I think they do try, but you know, they also are a business. So they want to look at how they can get the return on their investment. But if you come on board and say, I can, do it for 200,000. I'll try to find a way to do it um, on a cheap or I'll do it um, with trying to find other funding by grants and stuff like that. 
then your chances of getting that film made is higher. Okay, yeah, that answers the question. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next up, um, Jolene. Hi there, um, I'm Jolene. Um, I wanted to ask, since you mentioned that when you first start out, you won't exactly be doing what you want, and instead you'll be doing various jobs to slowly build up. With that said, have you ever questioned your place in the industry or questioned what you could offer as compared to other people around you? And if so, how did you personally overcome that and what keeps you going now? Okay, so I think in the beginning, yes, there were a lot of, but see, I think we come from very different generations where um, um, I, I get a lot of that now from the intern saying, this is not what I expected to be doing. But when I started out, there was very little expectations on what I was going to be doing. I was just happy to be able to be a part of, you know, filming every day. I'm, I was happy to be a part of a camera. I was happy to be a part of writing a script. So it was a lot of learning um, uh, for me in the beginning. So I think that's maybe a way to look at it. When you're learning something, you, you, you know, you, you kind of you kind of get hungry at learning stuff. And um, if something's not working for you, you can move to a different company that, that is doing something that you feel is, there's no, you know, nowadays people don't really hire people to, to, to stay in a company for very long. You're hired on a project, so you're very lucky. You can just, if something is not working for you, you know, it's gonna, it's got an end in sight. Um, and you keep working on the stories that interest you, I think. I think I have stuff that I'm still writing for like, it's been three years. So I, I keep a lot of things happening for yourself. You're young and you've got energy and you've got ideas and, you know, you've got everything going for you. So don't expect anybody to give handouts to you. So if there is something happening for you at your job, do that learn that but if you're interested in writing do that on the side when you are in between jobs at night whatever and but when you are in immersed in the in a set and then learn as much as you can from that opportunity make as much connections as you can networking is one of the most important thing in this industry and i don't mean networking but like hey i'll go out and do whatever give cards not none of that i think it's Establishing real contact, real communication with people, understanding them, and keeping in touch with the people. Half, do you know? I I have like so many interns that have come through, but maybe like four interns. I've had over like fifty interns. I think four interns have kept in touch, and they are the ones that keep getting the jobs. So take that as I, I don't know if I answered any of your questions, Jolene. Um, but yeah, so I th I think learn where you can from what you're doing but keep your hands in many, many different pies. Right, thank, thank you so much for sharing. You're welcome. Okay, next up, let's have Kay. Okay, hello there, uh, Miss Sabrina. First of all, uh, my name is Kay. Thank you so much for your uh, sharing just now. So my question is about the pushing boundaries. You know that sometimes movies have profanities, but it's just, a way to portray anger and so on and it's actually what most people react in natural days as well but sometimes it made the whole movie to be controversial or even sometimes banned in certain countries so what do you think about that and how to deal with it uh, especially when we're trying to pitch and like working on the script okay i think um yeah can you give me an example of, of what you mean by the swearing and, and stuff like that on the scene? Okay, uh, or I will just make uh, the movie Bubby that is banned in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. It's just like those kind of movies. Like uh, They're actually trying to uh, be to be realistic on what happens in the society. But sometimes yeah. it's just like, yeah, yeah, like sometimes it just got banned and in certain countries and how to actually deal with it. Should we be uh, realistic or should we have that boundaries? Um, okay, I think before I answer whether you should be realistic, I think the thing is you need to ask yourself why you're making a movie. How strongly do you feel about this movie? Are you doing it just to be controversial or are you doing it because the subject matter 
is something that is you feel very strongly about this is something that you've followed then if that is then if you've answered your that question and you say no this is a movie i feel really really strongly about passionate about i think about it all the time then you should make it anyway um the real but you know you have to also realize there are consequences and rules to certain things we may not like it but those are realistic rules so you're not allowed to to you know um to sort of belittle another race in this country so namri knew that those were the risk that he was he's actually i think he came back on march 15th he's detained so he knows the risk so i think if you know the risk but the film that you want to make is something that feels is really strong you feel strongly about it then make it but know the risk that you're going to make uh, that that you're going to have to take to do it um there's so many films that 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 you can make that does that isn't controversial in that sense um but i think pushing boundaries by what i mean is just kind of pushing the audience's maturity to a film um so for example there was a movie on uh, netflix called pieces of a woman it's very slow it's about a woman who had gave birth to a still stillborn um baby and it's 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 very emotional and that's kind of movies that don't happen here so i think if you do want to make a movie that is controversial and you know you're going to get into trouble for it um as long as you have a very strong reason of wanting to make it i think you need to ask yourself are you willing to take certain risks and that's something that no one can sort of decide for you you know law you cannot change the laws you cannot break the laws um they exist in all countries and i think um that's why uh, namri decided to um release this film outside of malaysia so got me but it just never got released yeah uh okay okay i see thank you so much you're welcome uh next up shawn hi miss um uh thank you so much for your talk miss uh, miss abrina i'm shawn and um my question is um for a lot of us who are like um starting out in the film industry um i was like i'm very curious curious on uh, what's your um what advice would you give to any of us who are like want, want to like film um stuff with limited resources such mm-hmm. as limited um budget limited crew maybe even a uh, limited equipment mm-hmm. so okay. yeah that's my question um you know you are so lucky in this day and age you already have an equipment when i started out this was not even possible so you do have pieces of equipment already with you i think they're not going to be obviously um uh comparable to some with with higher equipment but when you're starting out you need to start focusing on your stories what is going to tell a really good 8 minute story or 5 minute or 12 minute if you can't shoot a really good story on your phone then don't bother getting equipment that's higher up to to get what i mean because i i think a lot of us are focused too much on the hardware um there's a movie that uh, my fellow director made burner um called contena ana and i think he made it for like 100 grand i know it sounds a lot for you guys but when you come out in the industry 100 grand's not a lot um and it went to the um, uh, Asian Academy Awards and and you know it was nominated so it's i think don't focus too much on the hardware know your budget constraint and maybe like start um do what documentary filmmakers make they they shoot bits at a time um so maybe you can do it in a way where you can get res- resources you can get your talent or whatever and shoot a little bit and then do some other whatever that you need to do and hustle and get more money and then shoot a little bit more and shoot a little bit more that could be one way to do it um but don't be discouraged by equipment there's a guy who did a talk here once we held a talk with a Australian filmmaker his name is Jason Van Genderen you should look him up he films completely on phone but he obviously fa- um, invests in the hardware to make his phone um and and the visuals from his phone a bit more filmic so um there are ways around it and, and i think really good stories um uh should be your main thing 
work, work, focusing on what your actors are, are you know how they are delivering their um, um, each scene. That's also what you can focus on, and don't focus too much on on hardware. So I think what if you have a really good script and you really believe in it, go to theatre actors. They are really good, and they're used to working on a budget. Uh, you know, your whatever's going to be on screen, which is your actors, and and the delivery of that, that's going to be your first focus. So focus on things that you can control and that you know will 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 make a difference. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing, Miss Sabrina. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, next up, Alex. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for a really inspiring talk. So I'm Alex and I just wanted to ask, since most of us will actually be starting out to go into our internships after this semester, what sort of advice could you give to us when it comes to searching for companies and networking as someone who's actually like me personally, I'm very unfamiliar with the industry, but I kind of want to know what, where is a good starting point for me? Okay. Um... I think, um, you know, there is a, a, um, a website, um, sorry, on Facebook. It's actually run by us. Well, it's called the Freelancers, Production Freelance Crew. I will give the exact name to to, um, to Sanja to you later. Um, but, you know, that's where people are constantly putting up job offers and stuff like that. And you, it, you should be aware of who's putting it up in terms of the companies that are, uh, that are doing it. If you're interested in film, there are some productions that work on just film and there's some productions that work just on TV. And there's one that like Wild Snapple, we work on both. So maybe look at some local films. So you guys all have Netflix, go on Netflix and see what Malay films are there and then scroll to the end and see which production company comes up. That then at least you start forming a database and that I believe will start you down a rabbit hole of finding the companies that you like and seeing, oh, wow, this, this has done this, this person has done that. Um, I think with networking is this day and uh, at this age you should be bold. Um, how I got my first job was I was actually right after university. I was the same. I had no idea where to go. Who do I even start to ask? I didn't know. Um, so I I got a job in a PR company, and I was cutting up newspaper articles on the company. And it just so happened I stumbled upon a newscaster um, article that I really liked, and I guessed her email address. I just guessed. I did like three, four different email addresses. I thought whatever her name is at so-called this company, this should be her email. And one of it actually was her email address. She wrote back. And that's how I got my first job in television. So I think there is no one way to network. There's no one way to hustle. Um, but start looking at that. So my advice is start looking at the, the Google Malaysian, top 10 Malaysian films and then see what companies made those. And just to an email and says, hi, I'm, you know, this person, I really like the movie that you made. Um, I'm hoping to get an internship or even sometimes you can say, can I even come in for a day or two to just shadow somebody? Who knows how and what you can think up of to be resourceful. Don't be afraid. You've got like, the worst people can do is don't answer you or say, no, you know, we, we don't have a, an opening for that. But Trust me, I get a lot of emails from people and I always appreciate the ones that have just come from not because of their internship or I think somebody wrote to me because they sat through a lecture and they were really, they asked me a lot of questions and I enjoyed that. I enjoy answering questions. So hustle however you think is going to get you there because that's that's what will make you stand out. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. That was really insightful. Thanks. Okay, so I think uh, we come to the end of the session. Uh, one more question here, Theodore, you put your hand up. All right, yeah. Uh, hi, Mr. Theo. So, um, the one thing I want I want to ask you, um, what would you advise for those of us who want to venture into silent films? Uh, not to say I'm not good at sure I think, but I prefer to use um, editing camera work and my talents to tell the story rather than dialogue because I find I find dialogue uh, rather uh, I, I just find dialogue very clunky. So yeah, what would you advise for us going into silent film? 
I mean, have you researched much about silent films? Like yeah, right. um, the the two more the two more known the two known ones that I know of are Hush and A Silent Place. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's, I really like. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Keep going. I, I really like, I really like their sound design, but both of them are two completely different um things you could say. Cause Silent Place is about you can't make a noise, and Hush is about a deaf person. But what I'm looking for is um it's also a bit kind of horror. So it's, I just let the aesthetics of the place, the camera work, all these kind of things to the story rather than dialogue let the audience figure it out for themselves yeah i mean i think everything that's that's that has a little is a bit different it can be challenging but also very invigorating so if you already know kind of like what you are trying to do with it and obviously with silent films like you said sound design is the most important thing right because that's how you're playing with the audiences plus what they're seeing is what they're hearing right it emphasized so I think if that's something that you're interested in, again, goes back to the thing somebody asked me before is, is you know, how do I um, um, how do I be realistic with movies? Should I push boundaries? I think, again, go back to why you're doing it. Why are you doing a silent film? I think for you, you said you're more interested in that rather than just a dialogue you want to. That's how you can see yourself exp expressing your way in film better, right? So that's something that you should pursue. It's it's very it's definitely out of my scope of something. I've never done a silent film, so it's very hard for me to kind of give you any advice on that. But I can just say that with any film that you want to do, if you believe in it and there there is um, there is enough research put in it and in ways to to know that this is going to to at least work for you. Um, and there is an audience market, obviously, with, like you said, with um, a movie like Silent Place. So you know there is an audience that, that would be, um, that would want something like this. It's really good because I think a lot of times the network and stuff like that, they're always trying to see something different. What can we do? What is it about this film that could also be pushed to marketing that would market it in a different way? So somebody is experiencing film in a completely different way. So I, I think it's great that you want to do this. And I think you should research it a bit more and pursue it and 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 maybe look into sound design a lot more um that's something that in malaysia in our films we are quite very we're quite new at it so sometimes when you watch a film you know there's unrealistic sound and it it does spoil a film a bit so um maybe in that sense for you is to look there i know there's one award-winning sound designer here in malaysia but um look that up do a bit more research on that for for uh, what's what what's available here okay all right thank you miss welcome okay so now we definitely come to the end of <laughs> our session uh, it's already four o'clock i just want to thank every one of you guys for being here today and especially a big thanks to uh, miss zabrina for her wonderful insights we look forward to having you uh, having her here again Thank you, everyone. Thank Much, you. everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.